1 John chapter 5, we'll begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Now look down at verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We sure do thank you for a good Sunday school hour. We thank you, Lord, for the good singing. We thank you for the good fellowship we've enjoyed. We thank you, thank you for the uh, Word of God. Now, Lord, as we come to you this morning, we know that there are some who are heavy-hearted. We know there are some who, oh Lord, are, have burdens. Lord, there are some who are facing uh, opposition. And Lord, we pray that you'd break through, and that God, you'd help folks in their infirmities. Lord, we do pray for those that normally are here who are sick or providentially hindered. We pray for Miss Noreen this morning. We pray for her sister. Lord, you'd intervene and touch her sister. Lord, we pray for Miss Samantha. Lord, you'd touch that child and help her. And certainly be with Miss Brandy and Brother Tony as they're concerned about her. Father, we pray for Miss Crystal this morning. We know she'd be here if she felt better. Lord, we're thankful that nothing serious happened to Miss Mary. We pray you'd give the doctors the wisdom as they run the test. and Lord, that they'll find why she passed out the other night. We pray for Xander that his arm would heal and God you'd help him. Pray for Brother Jim facing surgery tomorrow. You'd be with him. But Lord, I'm interested in the hearts of those in attendance this morning. And Father, I pray you'd put a hedge about us. And I pray, as Christians already prayed, that you'd bind the powers of hell. God, I pray that the sweet Holy Ghost would not be grieved or quenched this morning, but allowed to do his office work. And God, I pray that, Lord, if there's somebody here today cold and indifferent on God, that today would be the day they get their heart made right with the Lord. I pray for the saints of God that you'd send revival during these days. I know it's holiday season. What better time to have revival? And then, Father, I certainly am interested in those in our midst today that are not saved. They're not born again. They have not eternal life. I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. Father, I pray you'd use this unworthy vessel, and I pray that, God, you'd deal with hearts, and you'd help folks here today. God, get glory to your name. And God bless as only you can. We'll thank you and praise you for what you do, for it's in the wonderful and holy name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Amen. I'm interested in four words as an introduction. The first word I'm interested in is found in verse number one. It's whosoever. I'm interested in this word this morning because it's a Bible word. And this Bible word... Uh, has great meaning. Now there are some that will say that whosoever don't mean whosoever. I believe God uh, knows what whosoever means, and I believe God knows uh, what uh, needs to be said. When he pinned down whosoever, he meant whosoever. What's it mean? The word whosoever means any person at all. Any person at all. Don't matter what side of the tracks you was born on. Don't matter uh, 
how much money or how little money you've got, no matter uh, what your lineage is or what your heritage is or what your color is, doesn't matter anything. Whosoever means any person at all. It also means uh, whoever will. Whoever will. That's what it means. Uh, mm, can I say that whosoever means whosoever will? Can I say who can be saved today? Whosoever will. Jesus tasted death for every man. And it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, God did not predestinate who would be saved and who would be lost. God predestinated that Jesus would die on the cross uh, and that everybody that would be saved would be saved in Jesus Christ. Now, notice verse 1 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. Now, I know a lot of people that tell me they believe in God. They will tell me, Brother Phil, they believe that Jesus died on the cross and that Jesus is Lord. That don't mean they're saved. Whosoever uh, has a connotation or an attachment to it, what does it mean? Whosoever will, whosoever believeth on God, what does that mean? That means belief with obedience attached to it. Look again, verse number 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. Verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. It's not enough to believe in the Lord Jesus. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus. Uh, and as a showing forth that you have believed on the Lord Jesus, you will keep His commandments. Somebody that's saved is going to live like they're saved. Somebody that's saved is going to do saved things. Somebody that's saved is going to love God and love what God loves. What does God love? He loves the church. Loves the Word of God. He loves songs that glorify Him. He loves hanging out with God's people. Are you listening? To, uh, you, somebody that makes a profession, Brother Ron, that they got saved, but they never come to the house of God. Uh, 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 they never uh, get baptized. They never become a member of God's church. Uh, uh, never are faithful to the things of God. Uh, they made a profession, but uh, can I say in authority of the Word of God, there's no possession. Mm. Mm. Whosoever will, they can be saved. But if you truly get born again, mm, there's going to be a change in your life. We see that word whosoever. I'm not only interested in that word, I'm interested in verse number 4, the word whatsoever. It says, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. That word whatsoever interests me, Trevor. You're a smart fella. So I looked it up. Whatsoever means what it takes. So whatsoever is born of God, what does it take to be born of God? Well, it answers it in this verse. It says, mm, And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. What's it take? It takes faith. It takes faith. And the Lord Jesus Christ in the finished works of Calvary takes faith that there's an empty tomb that he resurrected, takes faith in the Lord in order to be part of that whosoever will crowd. Hmm? I'm interested in whosoever. I'm interested in whatsoever. I'm interested, my dear friends, in the fact that it takes faith in order to become a whosoever. Hmm? Can I say it's a faith that trusts God? I don't trust politicians. I don't trust a lot of corporate CEOs. I don't trust that we really should be paying 4 or $5 of a gallon gas. I don't trust that. Mm. There's a lot of things I don't trust, but you know one thing I have complete trust in? What God says. You know why? As I've been studying this book for 48 years, and God has never lied to me. God has never told me one thing and done something else. Mm. You've got to trust 
It's a faith that trusts. It's a faith that turns. It turned me from the direction I was headed to the direction I'm going. I was headed to hell, but now I'm going to glory. Hmm? I was headed for uh, uh, the wreckage of this world, but now I'm in the house of God. It was a faith that turned my direction. It's a faith that triumphs. It says we overcome the world. Our faith triumphs us over the world. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. What a blessing. Mm -mm. So we see whatsoever. I'm interested in two more words. I'm interested in verse number 10, the word witness. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son. Notice it didn't say in the Son. You're hard-pressed to go anywhere in the South and not find anybody that don't believe in Jesus. There's a difference in believing in Jesus and believing on Jesus. To believe on Him means you submit unto Him that He is Lord uh, and Savior and the only means for your salvation. Hmm. Again, it says, He believeth on the Son of God, hath the witness in Himself. I'm interested in that witness. What is that witness? Huh? His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. The moment somebody gets born again, uh, uh, the Spirit of God takes up His abode in them. Uh, 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 he does uh, uh, something that we can't do for ourselves. He cuts away that fleshly part of our heart, uh, and He moves in, and He seals us into the day of redemption. I know you all don't think I'm from the country. I'm from the country. I know you all don't think that. I'm not in the country now, but I'm from the country. I kind of like living in the city. I just blow the leaves down to the curb, and they come and pick them up. I don't have to go burn them in the backyard somewhere. You'll find out about all this you move down the country. Uh, I saw your driveway. What a blessing. That said, I wonder if they paved that. I said, they ain't paving that. They moved to the country. It's gravel and dirt all the time. What a blessing. Uh, what do you wreck your bike and that stuff, son? Huh? You're going to tear your knees up. I grew up in the country. I know you don't believe that. I grew up... Uh, uh, Brandon, you remember watching Maul canned green beans, huh? Oh, man, uh, I, I, I loved my Grandma's green beans. There was nothing like them, but I hated picking them, and I hated worse snapping them. I hated uh, 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 Paul would say, hey, boy, come out here, and they'd have these bushels of beans. Uh, said, get to snapping. I hated every bit of it. You'd have to string them off, and then snap them, and then snap them, and snap them. Your thumbs got sore snapping, and no matter how quick I went, them old people did about three to my one. I'm not kidding you, man. They, they was a snapping on my, uh, but I remember watching and uh, uh, Grandma would put them in the old mason jars uh, and she'd put water in there with them green beans, put a little salt in there, uh, uh, put them in them pressure cookers uh, and uh, you knew something had happened when that lid popped. Boom! Uh, uh, and I'd seen uh, uh, those go out in the garage and, and you could have buried them in the earth. It didn't matter. Uh, and I can remember uh, uh, years later, Josh, her going out to the garage, be mold all over that jar. I look nasty. I'm thinking, I don't want anything to do with that. Uh, but as soon as she popped that lid, uh, them green beans were as fresh uh, as the day we snapped them and she put them in there. Uh, and friend, uh, I may not look like much. Uh, may have a lot of mold on me. Uh, hey, may have a lot of corrosion on me. Uh, uh, but hey, listen, uh, on the third Saturday night of March in 1974, uh, I got gloriously saved by the good grace of God. Uh, and that day, the Holy Spirit sealed me uh, unto the day of redemption. Uh, and when Jesus blows the trumpet uh, and the shout of the archangel happens uh, and he steps out on the cloud and calls me home, uh, whether by the grave or by uh, uh, the rapture, uh, when he pops the lid off of this thing, uh, it's going to be as fresh as the day he saved my soul. Hallelujah. Mm, that's the witness in me. You know how I know I'm saved? I can't do what I want to do. Uh, there are certain words I can't say. There are certain beverages I can't drink. There are certain places I can't... Now, don't get me wrong. I could do those things. 
But there's something inside of me uh, uh, that convicts me not to do those things. Uh, that warns me not to do those things. Uh, I can't be what my flesh wants me to be uh, because there's a witness inside of me that tells me I'm a child of God. Uh, I'm interested in that witness. Let me ask you a question. Do you have that witness inside of you today? Hmm. You know, I worry about somebody that says they've been saved 20, 30 years, but when they say they read the Bible, they don't understand it. And you see, part of that witness is he leads us and guides us into all truth. And there's a whole lot of the Bible I don't understand. Half of it's not even been told. But I can read the Bible, and that witness inside of me begins to reveal things to me about this book. Why? Because he's the one that penned it down. Hmm. I'm interested in another word. I'm interested in this word found in verse 13. I'm more interested in the word written. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. I'm interested in that word written because it's referring to the Word of God and it's referring to a promise. And again, God cannot lie. I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not so interested in your feelings. There are many days I don't feel too good. There are many days I don't feel too saved. But I am. I'm not so interested on your teachings or your upbringing. Now, thank God for parents that did teach their children some things, like how to pull their pants up and put a belt on. And I, I am thankful that your parents instilled some things in you, like how to brush your teeth and stuff. But when it comes to spiritual things, I'm not so interested in, in what Grandma used to teach or what Grandpa used to say. I'm interested in what God says. Because the Bible makes it clear we've been begotten by an incorruptible seed, the Word of God. Why do you think there's some 50 different versions of the Bible? Why every time they come out with a new version, it's to attack this one? Because if I was the devil, I wouldn't want people reading the right one either. Mm. I'm interested in verse number 13 says, These things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. With God's help, I want to preach on that thought this morning, having eternal life. Now let me qualify this by saying every person in here, every person that will watch this online, every person that will ever listen to this message has eternal life. Amen. You're going to spend eternity in one of two places. But the eternal life that it's talking about here is eternal life with the Lord in glory. In order to have eternal life, I want you to notice a few things. I want you to notice, first of all, the act of salvation. The act of salvation. Can I say, first of all, the act of salvation is supernatural. It is nothing that you can accomplish yourself. It is nothing you can earn. It is nothing you can do enough works for. It is not anything that you at all can do to impress God to get. It's supernatural. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, verse number 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope uh, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, see, it's supernatural. Uh, in order for us to have eternal life, it took a supernatural event uh, where God's Son uh, uh, bled and died on Calvary and was buried, uh, and three days later, under His own power, resurrected from the dead. Uh, listen, you can be religious and believe in Muhammad. Muhammad's still in the grave. Uh, you can believe in Buddha, he's still in the grave. Confucius is still in the grave. Uh, hey, uh, David Caress and Jim Jones are still in the grave. Uh, every pope that's 
that's ever been is still in the grave. Uh, uh, there's only one that resurrected under his own power, uh, and his name is Jesus Christ. Uh, First Peter also goes on to say this in verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ uh, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Uh, uh, if you're here today and you don't know the Lord, this isn't going to make sense to you. Uh, uh, but going way back uh, 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 to the days of Moses, uh, 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 there was an event where God's people were held in bondage. Uh, and God gave Moses uh, a decree that every household uh, of Israel, if they took a lamb uh, and they slew it and they put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost uh, and lintels of their house, uh, God was going to send a death angel. Uh, and when he saw the blood he'd pass over that house uh, every other house the firstborn in that house had to die uh, listen that was a picture uh, and it became a feast of the Jews uh, and for centuries uh, the Jews would offer up a, a, a blood sacrifice of a lamb uh, every Passover uh, they were all just a picture uh, that one day God would send his glorious lamb his only begotten son uh, and he would come uh, and he would bleed and die and shed his blood uh, uh, to pay for your sins and my sins. Uh, you see, God made man, uh, and he put him in a perfect environment, uh, and he told him he could eat of every tree of the garden except for one. Uh, and when man chose to disobey God, uh, sin came into this world, uh, and death by sin. Uh, and we were all conceived in sin, uh, and we're all sinners. Uh, and the only hope to pay for our sins uh, is what Jesus did on Calvary uh, when he shed his blood to pay for our sins uh, and appease the wrath of God. Uh, and it takes his shed blood uh, and faith in his uh, uh, being our Savior and resurrecting from the grave. That's the only hope for us to have salvation. That's all supernatural. We couldn't do that. Jesus was born of a virgin. We can't do that. And we'll celebrate that coming Christmas. He lived a sinless life. We can't do that. The reason His blood's important, His blood came from glory. It didn't come from man. Uh, and His blood was untainted without sin. Uh, he who knew no sin became sin that you and I might be made the righteousness of God in Him. It is supernatural, the act of salvation. Can I say this? It is spiritual. Yeah, and I'm not talking about this woolly booger stuff that they do down there with crystals. I'm talking about it's really spiritual. The Bible says in John chapter number 3, one of the, uh, uh, the most religious men of Jesus' day, his name's Nicodemus. He's a ruler of the Jews, of the synagogue. He has become a Pharisee of Pharisees. He's religious, has the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, has that committed to memory? I mean, was, when it comes to touching the law, you could not touch this man's life. Far more religious than anybody in this building, including me. Hmm? I might have five verses memorized in them books. I don't have all five books memorized. He did. He comes to Jesus by night. And he's seen something and heard things out of Jesus' mouth he'd never heard before. And he's wanting to know what it takes to have eternal life. Listen to what Jesus tells him, verse number 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? See, Nicodemus is thinking about naturally. He's thinking about uh, 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 how we would do it uh, in the physical fleshly world. He doesn't realize Jesus is talking about a spiritual birth. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. When you and I were born of our mothers, we came through a sack of water. Hmm? 
But hey, that's the natural birth. But we need a spiritual birth. We must be born again. Uh, uh, the Spirit of God has to birth us into the family of God. Listen, here's how it works. Uh, when we didn't know God, when we didn't know God loved us, when we didn't know God cared about us, we were lost in our sins. Uh, the Holy Spirit came to where we were, wherever that was, uh, sitting in a church service, being on the job, being at the house. Uh, and something said, you need to go to church. You need to call a Christian. You need to read the Bible. Something entered your mind to tell you uh, you needed God in your life. Uh, that was the working of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus said, no man can come to the Father except he be drawn. Uh, it was the Spirit of God that revealed to you, uh, maybe in a church service, maybe somebody witnessing to you uh, that you was lost, that you was uh, a sinner, that you needed to be saved from your sins. Uh, that just didn't pop into your mind. Uh, uh, the Spirit of God uh, revealed unto you your lost condition. Uh, and my dear friends, maybe in a service like this, sitting in the pew, uh, uh, realizing you needed to be saved. The preacher preaching. The Holy Spirit came to where you were in the service uh, and began to say, you're the one. You need to be saved. Uh, Jesus loves you. Jesus will save you. Uh, and by putting that faith that we talked about a minute ago in the finished works of Calvary and coming and asking Jesus to save you, all that is a work of the Spirit of God. Uh, and the moment you put your faith in the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, uh, the Spirit of God birthed you into the family, sealed you into the day of redemption, just like I talked about a minute ago. It's a supernatural act. It's a spiritual act. But can I say it's a simple act? Religion makes things hard. Mm, salvation's simple. The Bible says in John 3.16 that everybody knows, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You've got to believe on the Lord. Romans 10.13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ephesians 2.8.9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I've heard people say, I've been in church all my life. I'm going to heaven. You can be in church, and you can be here after Jesus come and take the church out and still come to church. That don't make you going to heaven. I've been baptized. Baptism doesn't, doesn't put you in the family of God. Uh, it's a spiritual baptism. You've got to realize you're lost and call on the Lord and ask Him to save you. Let me ask you a question. Can you go back in your mind right now to the place where you got born again? Can you go back to that place when you knew you was lost and you called on the Lord? There's been folks got saved at the house. My daughter got saved at our house. There's been Jordan, or my son got saved at our house. Huh? Christian got saved in the church. Can you go back to the place where you got saved? Where you realize you was lost and you called on the Lord and asked Him to save you? Mm. Can you go back to that service? Can you go back to that conversation? Can you go back to that point where you got born again? Because, friend, if you can't, then you're not born again. Amen. Listen, there's a lot of things that I've forgotten because I'm getting old. But there's some events I've never forgotten. I've never forgotten the day I got married 33 and a half years ago. I've never forgotten each day that my children were born. I've never forgotten that. Hmm? Jordan took forever. Uh, he, she was in labor with him over 24 hours. Christian about four hours Sydney said I'm not waiting boom here she was uh, the OB doctor didn't even make it uh, I remember those days there are a lot of sporting events in my life that I remember there's a lot of church services I've been in that I remember but I cannot forget the day that I met the master they changed my life uh, it's simple to be saved you just got to know you're lost and be willing to trust the Lord Jesus it's a simple act Acts 11 21 says and the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and here it is and turned unto the Lord salvation's a turning, report, turning point it's repentance and faith believing on the Lord and turning from the direction you was headed hmm? when you're willing to turn from your life to eternal life and put your faith in the Lord he'll save you we see the act of salvation uh, let me give you the advantage of salvation 
What's so important about being saved? Well, first of all, it grants you a relationship with the one who formed you in the womb. I don't have to go to Jerusalem to see an empty tomb to know that Jesus is alive. I've done talk with him today. I have a relationship with him. You said, you're loco. You're talking to somebody that's not there. Oh, he might not be there in your life, but he's there in my life. Huh? Oh, I talk to him in prayer. He talks to me through the Word of God, but he also speaks to me every now and then through the Spirit of God in my heart. I've talked with I have a relationship with him. I like that old hymn. He walks with me and talks with me and tells me I'm one of his own. What a blessing to know uh, him and know that he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. But not only does it grant a relation, it grants riches in this life. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Those that have eternal life live an abundant life. We not only have the Lord, we not only have a church family, we not only have the goodness of God, but we, we're blessed with the fruits of God. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, uh, all those things that the Holy Spirit develops in our lives. What a blessing. Hmm? You know, if I wouldn't say by the good grace of God, there's no telling how much hate would be in my life. I'm product of a broken home. I was raised in a redneck world. I certainly wouldn't have all the friends that I have that are uh, down there on the islands with Naj. I'd have hate in my life. You know why there's so much hate in this world? They don't know the Lord. When Jesus saved me, he replaced all that hate and bitterness with love and joy and peace. What a blessing. I can be happy even when Joe Biden's president. One well, preacher sent me a picture of him today holding a turkey saying, Happy Fourth of July. <laughs> Y'all watch him crazy preachers. Uh, I have the riches of fruit in my life from the Spirit of God, but I have the riches of freedom. The Son has made you free. You're free indeed. I'm not bound by my sin anymore. You know why you can't quit sinning? You know why that addiction you have has a hold on you? Because the Lord don't. But if you give your life to the Lord, He'll break the chains, even the chains of addiction. I have freedom. I have fruit. And can I say, these riches are forever. I have eternal life. What a blessing. But not only a relationship and riches, I have rewards in this life and the life to come. Can I say this? I also have rest. The Bible says there remaineth therefore rest to the people of God. I'm not stressed out like this world is, wringing my hands, uh, worried about tomorrow. I know who holds tomorrow. Hallelujah. There's the advantages of being saved. There's the ambition or the purpose of the saved. Why did God save us? Why in the world did he die for us? And then why did he save us? Can I say, he didn't save you so you can sit around and ask for blessings. He didn't save you to sit around. Uh, can I say that God purposes his children to worship? It is the will of God for us to worship and glorify him. He not only saved us to worship him, he saved us to be a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hidden. He saved us to be a witness. Jesus, the last thing he told his disciples before he ascended into heaven, he said, uh, uh, when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, ye shall be witnesses unto me uh, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. God saved you so you could tell others how they can be saved. Mm -mm. One preacher said, I was just a beggar and found the bread, and I'll just tell every other beggar where they can find the bread. And Jesus is the bread of life. And can I say this? He also saved us to withstand. Ephesians 6 tells us, having done all to stand, stand therefore. Christians are to take every punch that the devil throws at us and just keep standing. Hmm? It's one thing when somebody fights. It's another thing to see somebody just stand there and take every blow the devil can throw at him. Hmm? Uh, it inspires people when somebody just keeps getting back up. Uh, there's the ambition of the saved. Let me ask you this, child of God. 
How many folks have you prayed for to get saved? How many folks have you witnessed to? How many folks have you told there is a better life? Or are you guilty like a lot of times I've been guilty? You're guilty to complain about everything going on and not guilty to point them to Jesus. Can I say there's an attack on the saved? 2 Corinthians 10 tells us, verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Ephesians 6, 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. See, the devil's afraid of you and I. He knows if we are the witness that we can be, then others are going to be saved. So he does everything he can to attack us to keep us from shining for Jesus, to keep us from telling everybody they can have eternal life, to not show the joy of the Lord, because that's our strength. Mm. He attacks us. He strives to deflate us. Boy, did you ever after a revival meeting think you could take on the world, only two days later the whole world come against you, deflate you, you lose ground? That's what he does. He wants to knock the air out of you wants to deflate us. He wants to depress us. I've never seen the attack of depression on God's people like I have in the last couple of years. The devil knows his time is short and he's pulling out all the stops. And see, if he can get you looking around or looking inward, you'll get depressed. That's why the Bible says looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. If you just look up, it'll help you with a lot of that stuff. But depression's real. The devil's pulled out all the stops. He attacks us to deflate us, depress us. But he also attacks and strives to cause us to doubt. Doubt the word of God. That's how he got Eve. Doubt the, the things of God, praying and witnessing, living for God, and to even doubt your salvation. Now, I've heard people boast, I've never doubted. Praise God. I wouldn't boast too much. Peter boasted that he'd go all the way to death with the Lord. The Lord said, Satan had desired thee to sift thee as wheat. And Jesus didn't say, I'm going to keep you from the sifter. Jesus said, I pray for you that your faith fail not. He said, and when thou art converted. In other words, you're going through it and you're going to mess up. Uh, you better be careful how you boast. The Lord just might let the devil knock your legs out from underneath you. But a lot of folks do deal with doubt. Can I say, you're not in bad company. Jesus said the greatest man born a woman was John the Baptist. I could take you and show you where, Je where John the Baptist was full of the Holy Ghost in the womb before he was even saved. He leaped in the womb. I can take and show you that he preached and the whole nation of Israel knew he was a prophet of God. They came out just to see and hear what he had to say. And then John's thrown in prison. This is what he said. Luke 7, verse 19. And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? Sounds to me like John's starting to doubt. First time he heard the name Jesus, he leaps in the womb. But now he's doubting. It was John that saw Jesus come to the river Jordan and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And now he's saying, Art thou he, or should we look for another? I'm saying if John the Baptist could doubt, so can Johnny or Susie Baptist sitting on a church pew. Mm. Now listen, I want you to pay real close attention. I'm going to try and help you if you're dealing with doubt. In Matthew 3, 17, when Jesus is baptized of John, the Spirit uh, uh, comes down in the form of a dove, and the Father said this, and John heard him. He said, This is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased. That's what God said. That's in Matthew 3. The very next chapter, third verse, Jesus is led by the Spirit to the wilderness where He fasts 40 days and 40 nights, and the devil comes to tempt Him. 
And by the way, if the devil will tempt the Son of God, don't you think you're, you're too big for him not to tempt you? But in chapter 4, verse number 3, this is what the devil said. Now remember, the Father done said, This is my beloved Son. Now the devil in chapter 4, verse 3 says, If thou be the Son of God. Now in chapter 3, he is the Son of God. Chapter 4, the devil says, If thou be the Son of God. Can I say you will not have any ifs of doubt without the is of possession. And if you're not saved, then the devil's not going to doubt you whether or not you're saved. The devil don't want you thinking about being saved. But if you've been saved, I promise you there might be some ifs come to your life. Mm -mm. Maybe that'd help you, huh? Listen, Leonard Ravenhill, one of the greatest writers on revival this century. I've got all his books on my desk. Leonard Ravenhill called this thing of Christians doubting Christians haunting. He says, it shows that they care too much to a fault. They're so concerned about their salvation, they're afraid they might not have it right. Hmm? He said, doubting doesn't show something is wrong with you, but that something is right with you. So think about that. There's the attack on your salvation, attack of the saved. And then let me give you this, I'll be done. There's the aftermath of not being saved. The consequences of not being saved. Mark 16, 16. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. That's what the Bible said. The Bible said if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to be damned and you're going to spend your eternity in the lake of fire. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. See, the world wants you to think you die and that's it. But if you die without the Lord, you're not only going to spend eternity in the lake of fire, but the wrath of God's going to abide on you. You see, Jesus is willing to pay for your sins, but if you reject Him, you'll pay for your own sins for all of eternity in a place called the lake of fire. One of the saddest verses in the Bible, Revelation 20, 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Friend, whosoever means you. And what it takes is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been written in the Word of God, whosoever believeth on the Lord shall be saved. You've just got to put it into practice. Will you believe and trust what God says? Friend, you don't have to die and go to the lake of fire. Jesus died so you wouldn't have to. You can be saved from your sins. If you're here today and you're not saved today, today you can be saved. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Hard not your heart is in the day of provocation. Now's the accepted time. You can be saved today. I know how the devil works in a crowd this size. You'll think, well, what will these people think of me? I'll tell you what this crowd will think of you. They'll be, they'll be thrilled for you. Because those that are here that are saved once stood where you stand. And they know the other side. The other side is wonderful. And they want you to experience that by being saved by the good grace of God. I know how the devil works. The devil will say, well, not today. Just put it off. Can I say graveyards are full of people that had intentions of getting saved, but they just put it off one day too late. You can be saved today, friend. Jesus loves you. This church loves you. These people love you. You say, they don't even know me, you know, but they know God, and God loves you, and they love you, and they want to see you saved. In a moment, we're going to have an invitation. We're going to invite you to come and put your faith in the Lord. If you're not saved, you can come and say, Preacher, I don't know how to be saved. If you come, we'll get somebody to take a Bible and show you what the Bible says. You can put your faith in what God said, and you can be saved from your sins and be a recipient of eternal life. Here in a little over a month, we're going to have Christmas. We're going to pass out gifts. How horrible if somebody gives you a gift and you never open it. You just throw it in the corner and it sits there. The greatest gift ever been given, God gave His Son for you. And all you have to do is receive Him. My dear friend, won't you receive him today? You're here today and you're saved.
but you've not been an effective witness. Why don't you get in the altar and say, God, help me be a better witness. People all around me are dying and going to hell. Lord, help me make a difference in somebody's life. Maybe God spoke to you about something else. Whatever God spoke to you for, that's what the invitation's for. Come and do business with God. But above all, if you're not saved, don't leave here lost. Why don't you come? Give your heart and life to Jesus. Be a recipient of eternal life. Be the best day of your life. Say, how do you know? Because I, I, it happened to me 48 years ago. I'm still talking about it. Because it's the best day that ever happened in my life. It'll be the best day for you. Why don't you come and trust in the Lord? Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. While they're picking out a song, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we sure do love you. Thank you for first loving us. Oh, Lord, I pray you take my feeble efforts, my stammering tongue. And Lord, I pray the Holy Ghost will find something he can use to speak to people's hearts. I pray for those in our midst today that are unsaved, that today they'd get tired of their sinful life, having no joy, no peace, no rest. And they'd come and give their heart and life to Jesus. Lord, I pray for those that are saved, but they're living far beneath the privileges of a child of God. I pray that today would be the day to get things made right. And then, God, we certainly pray for your children. Somebody might be really struggling. God, maybe today they'll get the help that they need. Whatever is needed, I pray you'd speak to hearts. But above all, convict sinners. And God, I pray we'd see folks saved. Well, thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.